this has been 30 years, 30 years in my life and in the life of so many people. And I don't know if you heard the latest story. People were like electroshock. They went to psychiatry. All kind of thing happened. This is enough. We're in Canada. It's time now. We repair what we did. We want to do good. We have to go in the past and fix what we did. At the turn of the millennium, the liberal government of Jean Chrétien was still in power in Canada. LGBTQ 2S public servants were slowly being accepted in jobs across the federal government, but were still having to fight for all of the same benefits that their heterosexual colleagues took for granted. It's during this period that folks like Gary Kinsman, Patricia Gentili, Lynn Golikur, and her partner, Carmen Poulain, were all doing their important research, which would go on to help gain an apology from the Government of Canada, which you will hear about in this episode. As the public services policies and benefits were updated to include the same-sex partners of federal employees, so too did the RCMP and Canadian Armed Forces for their respective members, albeit reluctantly. John McDougall confirmed this for me. When you last heard from John, he was living a life of hellish homophobic bullying in a Calgary infantry unit. Thanks to the helping hand of an ally that he didn't want to name, by this time John had had a transfer to one field ambulance in Edmonton, a major military installation. He was now living as an out and proud soldier, whether other soldiers liked it or not. I went to the unit and I said, I want to get the paperwork for same-sex benefits for my partner. The administration officer at the time says, okay, gets the paperwork together. He says, come on, we'll go down to Tim Hortons and we'll sign it there. I said, why don't we just sign it in your office? I'm not comfortable signing this in my office. And I went, this is a military document. Same-sex benefits are legal in the military. We will sign it in your office. Begrudgingly, we went into his office and Dave and I signed the papers. We're not the first, but we are one of the first to get same-sex couple benefits in the military. So we were, uh, we were very, very proud of that moment. And that's when, I think that's when things started to change from my ability to advocate to the military listening to what needed to change and how that needed to change. Hello and welcome to Queer Legends, an oral history podcast. This is episode 7 in our 8-part series that tells the true story of Canada's LGBT purge. Season 2 of Queer Legends is supported in part by a community grant from the LGBT Purge Fund. In 2001, under Defence Minister Art Eggleton, the Canadian Armed Forces finally permitted women into all areas of the armed forces. Coincidentally, that's also the same year that I joined the Federal Public Service as the Head of Media Relations at the Treasury Board Secretariat. The head of our communications branch was a hilarious and very well-respected openly gay man. I was completely oblivious to any kind of purge. In 2003, the Liberals turned to former Finance Minister Paul Martin to take over from Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. The Nova Scotia Supreme Court ruled that banning same-sex marriages was unconstitutional on September 24, 2004, effectively changing the definition of marriage in the province to the lawful union of two persons to the exclusion of all others. Prime Minister Martin threw the question of same-sex marriage to the Supreme Court of Canada for an opinion known as a reference, punting the parliamentary debate on equal marriage until after the 2004 federal election. Canada became the fourth country in the world to legalize marriage equality under Liberal Prime Minister Paul Martin in July 2005. It didn't take long for two men, a Canadian Forces sergeant and a warrant officer, to be married in the chapel at CFB Greenwood, Nova Scotia, in the military's first gay wedding. The honeymoon was over seven months later when no longer progressive conservative leader Stephen Harper was elected prime minister and formed what they insisted on calling Canada's new government. Harper's government was known for its socially conservative caucus and for having a couple kind of closeted cabinet ministers whose sexuality was only ever discussed in polite or politically neutral company. Then the Canadian War on Queers was published in 2010 and that really stirred things up. In fact, Patricia Gentili and Gary Kinsman, as a result of their initial research for the book, were among the first to ask for a government apology for the LGBT purge. Yes, that's much more the research report that we developed. 
um, which was, you know, yeah, sorry. It was based on your yeah. initial research, that request. Yes. Um, we, we produced a research report just based on the 1960s, largely. I mean, the Canadian War on Queers goes much, much further than, than that. So we demanded an apology. But also remember that in 1992, Sven Robinson asked Brian Mulroney for basically an apology or at least an investigation of what Dean Beebe had discovered in the, art, the documents he got released under the, the Freedom of Information. And of course, Brian Mulroney said he would look into it and nothing ever happened. So there's been various attempts to talk about things that might be apologies over many decades. Your research, was, at, along with Patrizia, and I've spoken to her for this already, um, was pretty awesome and was sort of like the catalysts for a lot of things. How does that make you feel? I think we felt really good about it. It took a long, long time. I mean, I originally started to do work on this right after Dean Beebe's documents re were released in the early 1990s. So it took a long time, and we did get some funding and various different research assistants along the way. But we learned an incredible amount. I guess the most significant thing for the Canadian War and Queers book was the forms of resistance that people actually engaged in, the act of obstruction of what uh, the RCMP and police forces were trying to do, um, the ways in which people developed forms of non-cooperation, which actually created lots of contradictions and problems for the RCMP and the other forces involved in the purge campaigns. Um, and I guess the other thing was, it was really important to see how our book and the responses it got helped to open up, open up the space for more people who'd been directly affected by the purge campaigns to start to come out and speak publicly. That included people like John McDougall, who was so comfortable in his skin by 2013 that he had no problem asking his commanding officer to fly the pride flag at CFB Edmonton in June of that year. It was in all of the newspapers and made national headline news on all of the networks. Here at home now on a story that began with a simple gesture. For the first time in Canadian military history, a gay pride flag has been raised at a base in this country. It's yeah, awesome, sir. I cannot believe it. Well, no, well done, you. Thank you. Well done, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. National Defense even commemorated the flag raising in an October 2021 article in their Western Sentinel newspaper under the headline, cultural shift felt throughout the Canadian Armed Forces with raising of pride flag. With a swell of supporters made up of community leaders, LGBTQ members, former and current Canadian Armed Forces members and their families, CFB Edmonton performed a simple act common to the military that represented a cultural change in the Canadian Armed Forces and Canadian society as a whole, wrote military author Ginger Lamoureux. CFB Edmonton, it continued, which is the most populous army base in Western Canada and is located in the heart of the country's conservative heartland, made history as the first Canadian Armed Forces base to raise the pride flag on June 7, 2013. That's a great story. I just wish that the Western Sentinel or anybody else in the media back then had caught what I consider to be the much bigger story. Here's Major John McDougall. We raised the first pride flag on the base in Edmonton in 2013. It was first for any military base in North America, probably the world. I mean, I've been trying to find anywhere else, and I haven't yet. But the sergeant major of the base, the senior non-commissioned person for the base in Edmonton, refused to come, sent his second in command. We raised the pride flag. It came down a week later. And they cut the flagpole down so it would never happen again. So annoying. And so they've taken the flagpole down, just they won't have to ever raise Correct. one again. The, it, was in, it was in front of the headquarters building, and they cut it down. What was the flagpole normally flying? Uh, no, it flew uh, the Métis flag. It flew um, a Mother's Day flag. It flew any special... It was a special events pole, and it f flew for whatever the event was, um, but no longer... Last time I spoke with John, he was trying to get a plaque erected at the spot where the flagpole was, which raised the first rainbow pride flag on a Canadian military base. Now, back to author, professor, and activist Gary Kinsman. We talked to a number of those people in um, putting the book together. But what became clear was that people actually wanted to do something about this. So it wasn't just there was this book and we'd done some really important research. It was that was tied into what people who'd been purged actually wanted to do. And they wanted an apology. They wanted to get rid of any of the criminal code offenses they'd ever been charged with. 
and they wanted compensation or reparations for what had happened to them. How did you all come together initially? Do you remember? Well, yeah. Um, like I said, in 2011, I, I retired from Canada Post. I have all this time and on my hand. And, you know, things happen when they're supposed to happen. You remember Diane Pitre. She was purged in the early 1980s, but never stopped looking for a chance to seek justice for what happened to her and to so many others. As you'll hear in a moment, Diane was about to become the very first member of the We Demand an Apology Network. We're doing the dishes, and I hear on the TV, Peter Stouffer, member of parliament for Nova Scotia, and Peter said, yelled something about the purge that it should have never happened. And you know, at that point, you can back up the TV. So I back up and I said, who's that guy? So I look him up on the on Google and get his email address and I send him an email. And I said, Gary, I said, you talked about the purge just happened to me. Peter, I mean. And he, he said, yes. I said, I want you to help me get an apology. He said, Diane, he said, I'd love to, but he said, you're all alone. I said, you know, I can't do this if you're all alone. So I, I created a Facebook page called You Are No Longer Alone. I'm gay, I was kicked out of the military, blah, blah, blah. And uh, people started joining the group. And he kept calling me. Did you find people? I said, no. So I thought about Lynn Gallagher, because she had interviewed me in, in the late 80s. Uh, she was writing a paper on gays in the military. So I found, I found her email, and I sent her an email. She called me right away. We were, because it was my life partner and my co-researcher were heavily involved with both, with the apology and with the uh, class action. Lynn Gulliker's life partner is Carmen Poulain. Carmen was never a member of the Canadian Forces. She was a concerned family member and used her talents as a researcher to find the truth through purge survivors. Through her relationship with Lynn and their collective research about the purge, the couple provided important evidence to support the legal actions that would soon get underway. The apology, we We were part of the We Demand an Apology Network, which was a a group of approximately 30 academics and a lot of a lot of purge people were in there as well. And finally, uh, in 2014, uh, someone contacted me to say, hey, we met a guy, he went to the same thing than you, he got fired, he was in the public uh, services, and they want to ask for an apology. They have a group that they got together and they would like you to be part of it. So I'm like, okay. But honestly, I didn't believe in it. Me and didn't believe we could ever have an apology. I thought, that's it. You know, they did it in 92. They think that's the way they fixed it and they don't want to know anything. So I went, but it was not like, and then I saw that man that was so affected, but so affected that I felt privileged. And I was like, this is insane, so I'm going to help. And I did tell my story to two academicians of uh, St. John University in New Brunswick in 2000. So those women knew Gary Kingsman as well because it is with Lawrence University. So the first thing was the organization of the We Demanded Apology Network. We had media conferences in Ottawa. We we got the support of the NDP. Uh, We started to get the support of some members of the Liberal Caucus. Uh, We also started to get more and more media coverage, and eventually John Ibbotson does that sort of series in the Globe and Mail where he's basically talking about the need for reparations and compensation in particular. starts off with Clippert, but it broadens out to other people. He went to Parliament in 2015 to try to ask for apology, and nobody ever heard of it because we didn't have the right government to do something at that point. If we had launched this case during the Harper era, we still could have won the case, but I don't think that Mr. Harper would have settled it. Uh, We would have had to take the case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada in order to get redress. I have no doubt about that. However, I will say this for Mr. Harper. I don't believe that Mr. Harper, unlike Scott Moe, would have used the notwithstanding clause to overturn a loss on this case. Like the changing colors of the leaves, the fall 2015 federal election swept out Stephen Harper's conservatives in favor of a liberal government led by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. When Trudeau got uh, elected, 
The ministerial mandate letters were made public. And one of the things that it said in the ministerial mandate letters was you should get rid of all of the unconstitutional provisions in the criminal code and address these historic injustices. And so I got in touch with Egal and I said, look, we've been trying to get them to repeal the section 159, the, the anti-buggery law forever. And it's still sitting there. Everybody knows it's unconstitutional, but it's still sitting there. And it's an insult to have it still in the criminal code. And no government has had the nerve to actually repeal it. That's how powerful homophobia is. So now's our chance. Finally, EGAL, they created Just Society Committee. EGAL is one of Canada's leading organizations for 2S LGBTQI people and issues. They have been since long before the fight for marriage equality. I spoke to EGAL's executive director, Helen Kennedy. EGAL established a committee um, called the Just Society Committee that was made up of um, <clears throat> community activists and legal advocacy folks. Uh, and the, the leading lawyer in the case around the, um, the class action was Doug Elliott. Initially, that was the extent of our ambition, was to get Section 159 repealed. So what happened was Doug and I, I'll, I'll give you the right from the beginning, Doug and I met, we thought, okay, we've got to do something um, about the, the purge. We need to put more pressure on the new Liberal government. It's, the timing is right to have an apology, to basically do more advocacy around um, Uh, legislative requirements, looking at the age of consent, looking at other issues that we we basically, some of the legislative pieces that needed to be uh, addressed that were missing. And so Doug and I decided that EGAL would be the best organization, the best placed organization because of our history to establish this committee called the Just Society Committee, of which Doug was a member. And so then So we set up that committee, we met a couple of times, we did this report. According to Helen, it was a group of law students, a couple working out of a gal's office and a couple others at Doug Elliott's law firm who did the groundwork and drafting of the report. It was pulled together very quickly, she said, but it served its purpose. We held a press conference with myself, Doug and um, Todd Ross and Martine came Uh, I met Martine in the press gallery on the hill. And that Just Society Committee goal was to get some recommendation. So they got to 84 recommendations. And one of them was we demand an apology. So they asked us, you know, would somebody from uh, we demand an apology could come to Parliament with us to give the recommendation to the Justice Minister and do a press conference. So I flew there with my car <laughs> because it was really last minute and I made it just in time to meet Douglas Elliott. And uh, through that, there was as well uh, Michelle Douglas, there was Todd Ross that was there. So I met them all and we really thought by giving those recommendations with the one of th giving some apology that they would fall through. They did do certain thing, but The apology was not coming. We were trying every month we were meeting and we were waiting for the apology and we were still not getting the apology. So finally, in December, I brought my old file to Doug Elliott and I say, is there something we could do? And I said, yes, I do think we could do something. So we pursued trying to get some resolution of these various Uh, claims from the federal government, uh, while it was clear to me that they were going to uh, do something about some of the stuff that we were after, like repealing the law against buggery finally, it also became pretty apparent to me that the ask for the purge survivors was involved too much money, that they were not going to be able to commit to it. And so I talked to Todd and Martine about starting a class action. And I said to Martine, you know, you should go in Quebec. I'll find a lawyer for you there. And we found uh, Audrey Bachter, who's a 
one of the best lawyers of her generation. Doug wanted to bring this national class action. Um, and so uh, there were, you know, there were two schools of thought on it. Do we file in every province? Do we, um, you know, do uh, a, a, a national action in federal court? There's a lot of story around it, OK? Yeah. Because in Quebec, I can <laughs> tell you that they wanted to do their own class action in Quebec. And they wanted to do it only military. Uh, I didn't agree with that. I thought that the purge happened to public function and our SMIMP. We cannot separate the thing. And so what we decided to do, uh, so Doug asked me if I would lead the Quebec class. And so we filed on the same day uh, suits in Ontario uh, with Todd Ross as the lead plaintiff, and then in Quebec uh, as Martin Roy uh, as the lead plaintiff. Um, and then another action was filed uh, in federal court with Alita Satalik as lead plaintiff um, by uh, Koski Minsky and John McKiggan. Uh, and then we all got together uh, and decided to form a consortium and pursue a joint class action in federal court with the three lead plaintiffs working together to represent the class across Canada. So I had a lot a lot of people really mad at me in Quebec that I took the decision to do that class action when they were trying to get something together, uh, but that was not representing. So that was really hard for me to go through it uh, because when my knees involved, right, people go, they lose it. And people were looking to get a million each, you know, like nobody's never going to get that amount of money. So. It was a very hard negotiation. It was hard to stay concentrated and to please everyone. For me, it was really, really important that there's an amount of money that is put to tell the story. Because what I was realizing is nobody knew about it. And it was almost like when you were talking about it, sometimes people didn't care. They thought, oh, this is so long ago. And I was like, 1992 is not that long ago. And, but people didn't care, and some even organization of the community didn't care because they were scared. Oh, this is too politic. I won't get my subvention if I join with Martin or if I talk about that. Uh, a lot of resistance came from here. Uh, it was a lot more happening around Canada than in Quebec, which was really sad because for me, I was the one that decided to do a class action. I'm a girl from Montreal, born and raised in Montreal. So it would be fun and cool to, that we say something about that. While former Navy sailor Todd Ross went on to be the lead plaintiff in the LGBT purge class action lawsuit, it was Order of Canada member and Pride at Work Canada founder Martin Roy who first suggested the lawsuit. But before a lawsuit could be filed, the lawyers needed information and evidence. It's a good thing that Lynn Goliker and her partner, Carmen Poulain, had all of that research on purge survivors. The lawyers came to us because they heard about our research, and it was collected, like, say, prior to this. So it becomes, if you want to use, quote-unquote, more objective, because the purpose of our data, collecting that data, was not to change anything. We just wanted to hear people's stories, document them, and study what was going on for them. So they actually asked us to remine our data. And what they were looking for is to measure the hurt, literally. They wanted to have it classified into four categories and measure the hurt. So we remind our data and did a report for, for the lawyers that will never see the light of the day because they purchased and bought it. That's theirs, and usually they just stay closed. <laughs> but so our data was valuable in informing the lawyers and... It gave them a, a wider picture of what had gone on and what was going on in terms of that, the levels of hurt. And so gave them more ammunition when they were before, uh, you know, the opposition, though this didn't happen, or gave them more power and strength in their voice in terms of uh, what they would have, how they would have been arguing during the class action suit. How do you measure levels of hurt? categorize it. They give us the definitions and then we just went through our data and see, saw if anybody reported on it. If you look at when people applied to be part of the class action afterwards as a member, so everybody that was quote-unquote uh, fit all of the categories and was in during the purge, they were automatically classified as a member of the class action and they had to apply. So your, your work, as well as the work of people like Patrizia Gentili and Gary Kinsman and, and Dean Beebe, was really instrumental in helping to get all this stuff going. Yeah, 
Well, instrumental in the fact that it just gave the lawyers a lot more traction, a lot more confidence, and could be used against the government in terms of what they could ask for and how much they could ask for. So, you know, the more information you have, the stronger you're going to feel. Good morning. Bonjour. My name is Doug Elliott. I am a partner with Cambridge LLP in Toronto. I'm joined here this morning by my client, Todd Ross, who is a, for a gay man and a former sailor in the Canadian Navy, by my colleague from Quebec, Audrey Bochter, with the firm Irving Mitchell Kellickman in Montreal, and her client, Martine Roy, who is a former soldier with the Canadian Army. We're here today to announce the launching of a uh, Canada-wide class action lawsuit against the federal government as a result of the LGBT purge. Uh, lawsuits were filed yesterday in uh, Montreal on behalf of residents of Quebec and in Toronto on behalf of all people in the rest of Canada. Since the Just Society Committee report, which I helped author in June, we have been waiting patiently for the federal government to take action to redress these grievances but so far, we have just had kind words and no action. I'd now call on Todd Ross to say a few words. I, I've come today to speak to you about my experience. In 1987, I joined the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, became a Naval Combat Information Operator, uh, went through basic training, and uh, uh, served on board the HMCS Saskatchewan. Uh, about a year after I joined the military, uh, I found out that I was being investigated by the Special Investigations Unit, the SIU, uh, who had interviewed a number of people who I knew. Uh, throughout the next year and a half, uh, an investigation was conducted. Uh, I went through a few polygraph exams during that time. Uh, excuse me, just collect myself. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So through that time, uh, I went through the investigation. In 1990, uh, at that point, I finally admitted on a polygraph exam that I was gay, uh, at which point I had not even uh, uh, come out to myself. You can see it still affects me. Um, since 1990, I've really been... Uh, at that time, I knew an, uh, an injustice was done. I knew that it was not right. Uh, after I had admitted on polygraph exam that I was gay, uh, a process immediately started. I was offered an honorable discharge. Uh, I was told that if I took the honorable discharge, I could leave right away. If I didn't, I would l likely lose my security clearance and I would spend the next six months doing general duty until my term was done. Uh, obviously, I took the honorable discharge. Uh, and uh, uh, since that time, uh, uh, it, is, it is still something that's very difficult for me uh, to talk about. Um, I was able to stand here in, uh, in June this year as we announced the Just Society report. And uh, at that time, we, we asked the federal government to uh, begin a process to look at federal employees and, and people who uh, engaged with the federal government who were wronged. Uh, we are still waiting for that. Uh, we've waited a long time. Uh, so that's why I'm involved with this lawsuit. Today is the day to say, okay, you had time. There was a report that was made, an amazing report, with really like, it's not just we bring a problem, there was like a solution brought. We were told we will do it, we will apply this, nothing again. This has been 30 years, 30 years in my life and in the life of so many people. And I don't know if you heard the latest story, people were like electroshock, they went to psychiatry, all kind of thing happened. This is enough. We're in Canada. It's time now. We repair what we did. We want to do good. We have to go in the past and fix what we did. So this is why I'm here today, and I'm asking everybody for their support. And I'm doing this today just because I want to sit down and I want to put this at ease now. Thank you. Merci bien. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll take some questions now. We'll start here. Slossy, you mentioned at the beginning that you're hoping for a negotiated salt settlement. Right. Is this an attempt to push the government? We've heard that, you know, they may put out an apology. Is this an attempt to push them into something now? 
Well, it is indeed an attempt to press the government to come to the table, but we uh, want to be very clear about this. If the government doesn't come to the table, we will be proceeding with this suit. Um, we've been waiting for them to make a proposal to us and to talk to us. And all we've heard is uh, we've had tea and sympathy, except no tea. Uh, we've had no action. We've just had nice words. And we're dealing with an aging population. I did the Hislop case when we got to the Supreme Court of Canada. A third of the people had died already. And the Supreme Court of Canada said, dead people are not entitled to redress from the federal government. I'm not going to have Mr. Trudeau apologize to a cemetery. We want people to get help now. And so we can do it in a nice way in a negotiated settlement, or we can do it in a not so nice way in court. Yes. The statement claim asks for uh, $500 million plus another uh, $100 million in uh, uh, punitive damages. Yes, that's um, the Ontario Act. That's the Ontario Act. I wanted to, to straighten right. that. What about in Quebec? Like in total, how much uh, are, 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 is the damage claim and how many uh, people have signed on thus far? The damage claim in Quebec does not specify amount, but you can assume that it would be proportionate. We do not know exactly how many people have been affected by this. The way a class action works, you're included unless you opt out. We do know that at one point, the RCMP had files on 9,000 civil servants. So we picked our number of $500 million by saying there's probably at least 10,000 people affected. And I think, well, $500 million dollars sounds like a lot of money. That's $50,000 per person. $50,000 isn't much for ruining someone's life. Remember Shelley Coulter's experiences in the military? She was driven about as deep into the closet as you could go. In the 2000s, Shelley eventually needed to request leave to attend something that her significant other had going on. Significant other? asked her commanding officer. Yes, was her reply. And that was it. Shelley had just come out in the most boring and administrative way possible. She eventually left the military for medical reasons. When, in 2017, the uh, Prime Minister was pushing for an apology to be developed, there was already a committee that had, uh, that had been set up. Yeah, I was, uh, I was one of the members of the uh, advisory council that uh, Justin Trudeau appointed to, um, to look into the... Um, uh, what should you know? What should be included in an apology? Um, and it was a it was a challenging process. In fact, I was very much hoping that Gary Kinsman would be uh, a key part of that process. But um, Gary decided in the end that the restrictions on the advisory council were such that he couldn't participate. And I fully respected that. And we had kind of an inside outside strategy. When I got a call from Michelle, her friend. Sven Robinson was on the advisory committee and he had mentioned to Michelle that while they had a nice slice of society sitting on the special advisory committee, there was nobody there who had not just purge experience but didn't have military experience. And did she know of anybody? And she said, I know the perfect person, but let me ask first. I was on my way to uh, uh, an office that I had downtown at the time, when, uh, at, so driving on the Queensway here in Ottawa, when my phone rang and it was Michelle. We chit chatted for a little bit, and then she said, Remember that Prime Minister? had made a, a promise about uh, an apology. And I went, yeah. And she goes, so there's this committee. And I went, yes. And she goes, so you've heard of it. I said, whatever you're asking, yes, I'm in. Whatever you need from me, yes. So she didn't even get finished asking the question and I was in. So can you tell me about that? What? Uh, so you sit on this committee. What was involved in the development of this apology? Can you can you walk me through this? Like, I'm you're speaking to a former bureaucrat, a communications nerd, right? Like, so oh. I'm all about what was PCO saying, what was PMO saying, what you know, <laughs> all the jazz. 
How did this? How did they develop this apology? So we had uh, one member of parliament on there, and then the the rest were, as I said, um, a cut from society. So we had some some folks from the trans community. We had some folks from the uh, ed- indigenous community to represent the two spirited folks. The intent of the apology was to apologize for what the federal government had inflicted on the queer community uh, up until um, 1992. And so there was an awful lot of creeping outside of the parameters, um, wanting to include all sorts of different groups and be specific to all sorts of different groups. I did everything I could to uh, to consult with, with not just with Gary, but uh, broadly with people from across the country on the, the content of the apology and then, you know, was able to uh, have some, I hope, I'd like to think, some significant influence on, on the content of the apology. Things like including the reference to the bathhouse raids, which certainly wasn't in the uh, original apology and a number of others. And the reminder was we had to keep getting pulled back into the this is for for the folks who had been purged by the federal government. I can see like the sort of legalese squeaking in here. It's like, okay, the lawyers are there. We're f- staying focused. Yep. Yes, all these other yes. things are true. Yes, but we're talking about that. Bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it yes, in. Bring it in. Rain it in, girls. In the military, we call it scope creep. But and sometimes to make something better, you have to remove things. In the development of the apology, were, were, were there any moments where you kind of were like? ready to pull your hair out yes. as some bureaucratic negotiation sometimes happened? Like, I get the sense that there was some wordsmithing, perhaps? Um, there there was. Um, Spill the tea. Well, when we first, so we got, we went through all the, the, the negotiation. We talked about what, what we wanted to be uh, included. And then we, we took everything and we just kind of, we sent it to the the prime minister's office, and he had a speechwriter that uh, who he had tapped to uh, write up the speech, and we only got to see one draft of it um, before it was actually presented in Parliament. We were getting very close, so we go to this meeting, and they come in with two things that surprise us. First of all. They try to go backwards on one issue and to offer us less on one particular issue than they had previously, which shocked me. And then on the issue that was still on the table, they made a proposal that was really obviously going to be unacceptable. And I looked at my team and I said, they think they have us painted into a corner. They think that we have to take whatever they offer because we're this announcement is coming up and we are going to have to announce this and that they think that we are, they've got us over a barrel. So I talked to my clients and I said, look, I have a very um, difficult proposition to put to you. I said, um, I want to go in there tomorrow and tell them that they're, what they're proposing is unacceptable and here's what we want. But I also want to tell them this. I want to tell them that if we don't have a deal, that you're not going to go to the apology, that you're going to boycott the apology, and that we're going to make a public statement that the negotiations have failed and that the apology is insincere because the government has refused to provide proper reparations to the victims. And... uh, I going to tell you, my clients were about to throw up. They were really, they, they did not want to have to make that decision. They were very upset uh, about being put in that. They weren't mad at me. They were upset about being put in that situation. And eventually they said, okay, uh, you're right go for it. And so I went and I told them that and I said, so you'll have to go and tell the prime minister. He can either have me and my people inside the House of Commons cheering 
his, for his apology. Or he can have us outside the House of Commons picketing his government for refusing to be fair to us. Those are his choices. Now you go advise him. And off they went. We waited a while and they came back and they came back with a reasonable proposal. So we were able to do a deal. But I would call it a, a near-death experience. <laughs> it was very tense. The night before our, our apology, uh, the lawyers threw a reception at the, at the Lord Elgin Hotel, a renowned old place for homos to hang out. And I walked, I got, I got invited and I walked into this room with my wife. I had never met another purge survivor before. Sharp Doppler is a purge survivor who was in the House of Commons for the Government of Canada's apology in November 2017. They were purged from their amazing work inspiring young cadets in 1997 after enduring years of ruthless and calculated homophobic bullying, including from some lesbians who were trying to hide their own queerness. It's like when I was a sweet young baby dyke, you know, we all wondered where the old dykes were. They're out there somewhere. So I knew that there were other perch survivors out there somewhere, but I never actually met one. And so I walk into this room and I'm very energy sensitive. And I walk into this room and there's this intense atmosphere of sadness and anger and shame and pride and joy. And it was remarkable. And then the next day I got to sit in the House of Commons and listen to the apology. I know. You're wondering if Shelley Coulter had any influence on the text of the apology. I was too. Yes. So there's there's a part towards the end after he has said to those who wanted to serve but never got the chance, we are sorry, we are wrong. Um, and then he gets into, indeed, all Canadians missed out on, on the important, important contributions, contributions you could have could made have, to our society. Would have made to our society. You were not bad soldiers, sailors airmen and women. You were not predators. And you were not criminals. Now the original, the, the final draft said you were professionals, you were patriots, and above all, you were innocent. And for your suffering, you deserve justice and you deserve peace. And I went back to the speechwriter and I said, these people still are they still are professionals. They still are patriots. So the, the, and I had no idea that it was changed. So when the prime minister was giving this speech in parliament, that was the first time that I heard that it was changed to. You served your country with integrity and courage. You are professionals. You are patriots. And above all, you are innocent. That was so impactful. It's still impactful to me now. For all your suffering, you deserve justice. You deserve peace. It was a surprise. So can you think back to what you felt when you heard that? I burst into tears. I was so, I'm just, my eyes are tearing up right now, um, thinking about it. A little bit of pride for myself, but more Importantly, I knew the impact that that was going to have with the members of the community and with their families to hear that. Sorry, and I'm going to get weepy here. You're making me weepy too, okay, girl? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, because it, it's something that is important for, the, for a lot of folks in that crowd. They were hearing for the first time those words. We are truly sorry. Words you helped craft. Words that I helped craft, that I knew were important, that I knew were impactful. That's pretty amazing. It was an amazing moment. I'm feeling it right now. I sat there not believing that I was sitting there. And I listened very carefully to the words that were spoken. And I was holding my shit together really well until he got to the point where he said, you know, you weren't predators. You weren't all the evil, I'm paraphrasing, you weren't all the evil things they said about you. You were innocent. And above all, you are innocent. And as somebody who survived a fair amount of trauma, I'd never gotten an apology from an abuser before. The 
epiphany that occurred in that moment when the Prime Minister was apologizing was that for the first time I was able to reason that I'm not a bad person. I was sitting alone here in my condo in Victoria and I watched it live as he gave the apology and I cried like a baby. It was surreal. It's We're sitting down looking at uh, Monsieur Trudeau and he's telling us he's sorry and uh, Monsieur Trudeau, I've met him a couple of times, he is a very sincere, emotional guy, like when he talks about personal stuff, about, you know, apology and that. But then I was angry. It took 40 years to get this and you told me that it never existed and then you're telling me you're sorry. Why couldn't you have said you're sorry in 1982? the 1980s, they couldn't even admit it. So, and then they're apologizing. It, it, I'm happy, but it was also bittersweet. Uh, he would have been very, very supportive of everything that's being done now, the monument, the apology, and so on. I was very happy to hear the Prime Minister was going to make an apology. Uh, I, I think that there are a vast number of people in the community that want to hear that. I think there's a significant number of people who don't care one way or the other. And I think there's a whole lot of straight people who are pissed at him for doing it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to sit uh, in chambers when that happened. As a matter of fact, I was right behind um, Doug Elliott when, uh, when it was announced. It felt... I think I was caught in the excitement of it. Like, I, 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 my heart was racing. I was so excited. I hugged the person beside me. Um, and then we walked out of Parliament because it was an apology and there was, like, no... Nothing else. Like, not, this is our next steps. It was focused on an apology. It wasn't focused on what we're going to do next. And that really stuck with me. Why is it important for you to be sharing your personal story in this way? I think it's important because we don't believe that this could have ever happened in Canada. We as Canadians don't think that we were, we, we are capable of this kind of terrible actions against fellow Canadians. And when I tell my story, and I am almost universally received with empathy and uh, respect as I tell the story, it says to me that we are teaching ourselves in Canada that we must always be diligent of what the policies and um, actions our governments are doing on our behalf and that we are part of that democracy and we need to be vigilant. So, it's extraordinarily important, in my opinion, that Canadians know this story. Not just mine. Mine is one of thousands of other stories, many of which whose voices are silenced now as a result of um, the terrible harm that occurred to them. And collectively, we will have this documented and people will shake their heads and go, never again must we allow this to happen. Next time in the eighth and final episode of Queer Legends documentary series examining the truth of Canada's LGBT purge, the government's apology was just the first step towards justice for purge survivors. The Liberal government tabled a bill that would allow people who were convicted of same-sex offenses, such as gross indecency, to have their convictions expunged. And the class action settlement still had to go to court for approval and ended up becoming quite the courtroom drama. The people, the survivors that were in the audience, they didn't hear the judge at first or didn't understand what she was saying because it was so succinct. And they looked at each other puzzled and then they realized that she had approved it and they all started shouting, we won, we won. Survivors may have won their settlement, but things were far from settled especially when it came to the Liberal government's promise to release purge-era documents from the military, RCMP and Government of Canada. I have to say it's been incredibly, incredibly um, frustrating to deal with the Department of Justice in this process. Uh, they have blocked us every step of the way uh, to the point that we actually had to go to the federal court to try to get an order from the federal court for them to uh, uh, respect the terms of Schedule L, which was the provision that was included in the class action um, for um, access to documents. You'll also hear about a little LGBT purge mystery I've uncovered 
It involves a 1960s-era Canadian ambassador removed from his post, the Order of Canada, and a dusty old box of Rideau Hall documents missing the exact thing I went looking for. If you enjoy our stories, please show your support with a five-star rating and a positive review on this platform. Thank you for listening. Queer Legends and Oral History Podcast is a production of Secret Agents. Season 2 is supported in part by a community grant from the LGBT Purge Fund. The executive producer is Ian Capstick. Find Queer Legends everywhere great podcasts live. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, YouTube, and beyond. <laughs>